So thank you for that great talk. And uh, I'd like to also welcome everyone to our webinar series. Now I'm gonna talk about spinal stenosis, but I'm gonna talk about it from a surgical point of view so that uh, you can get an understanding of how we approach these patients for surgery and some of the decision-making that we have to go through. Uh, these are my disclosures, which should not affect anything that I'm gonna speak to you about today. So whenever we see these patients, unless it's an, an emergency, obviously I look at phase one as being sort of the conservative care, medications, physical therapy, other miscellaneous uh, treatments that you may wanna uh, provide for your patients. And that's usually the medical providers, oftentimes uh, their primary care physicians. I think phase two is sort of the next step, and that's where we get our physiatrists involved. Uh, and they consider injections, maybe some diagnostic studies, maybe some EMGs. And I always look at surgery as being the last step. And I always tell my patients, I think surgery is the last step. When it comes to surgery, I just wanna make sure everyone gets an understanding of how we approach things in spine. And so I'm gonna kind of go a little bit off topic here because when we deal with spinal stenosis, we're not just dealing with spinal stenosis. There's other pathology that's there. And I look at spine as being completely different than other areas of the body. And the philosophy that we have when it comes to surgical treatment of spinal disorders is totally different than what you'll see in other parts of the body. And I think this can, has led to some misconceptions uh, about spine surgery in general. And so what I always give an example of is, is that if you compare the spine to the knee, the knee is totally different. If you have arthritis throughout the entire knee, you can basically take care of all the problems in the knee and just do a knee replacement. And so you're not leaving anything behind. The spine is totally different. In the spine, our philosophy is only take care of what we need to take care of. And so David gave a great example of he had a herniated disc. So this is a patient with a herniated disc. This is a younger patient. And they have their primary problem is radiculopathy from stenosis, from the herniated disc. So if we were to do surgery, we would go in there and try to take the pressure off the nerve. What would we leave behind? We'd leave behind the arthritis in this disc. We'd leave behind the arthritis in this disc. We'd leave behind the arthritis in this disc. We're not taking care of all the problems in the spine. And I think people understand that. And when you have even older patients, when they come in and there's arthritis at every level and they have some mild stenosis, degeneration and back pain, but their main problem is an acute uh, L5 radiculopathy, and they have this acute disc herniation here at L4-5, we would probably just go in and do a microdiscectomy, clear their stenosis. We're going to leave behind all this pathology that's there. And that's how we treat spinal pathology. We rarely take care of everything. And so if you go back to the knee, oftentimes, if you, um, if you take care of all the problems in the knee, you've taken care of all the issues. Well, when we have these larger spinal scoliosis deformities that oftentimes have stenosis, even when we take care of them, we oftentimes don't take care of the whole spine. And even this patient that's had a very long thoracolumbar fusion for stenosis and scoliosis, we're still leaving behind the arthritis uh, above the segment. And so the other misconception that we have is that if you do a fusion, it's gonna lead to problems at the next level. And so here's a patient that had what is a, is a fusion at this level, uh, down the line, uh, they get problems at the adjacent level. So we've seen it, it's broken down and they have to have a fusion at the next level. So what happens? We, we blame the surgery. We don't blame the process. We don't say the patient has arthritis. We sit there and say the surgery caused the problem at the next level. And so let's go back to the knee analogy. If this patient has medial compartment arthritis and you fix the medial part, and then later in life, they develop problems in the lateral part, you're not going to blame the surgery here. You're, you're probably just going to say, well, this patient has bad arthritis. Uh, you took care of parts of it. And now we have to take care of the other parts. And so that's when we look at adjacent segment disease. And if you look at the studies on adjacent segment disease, which is the problems after you do a fusion, um, it's actually the same whether you do a fusion or not. So they've actually followed patients that had no fusion, but they had spinal problems. And they found out that they still develop problems at the adjacent segment, even though they didn't have a fusion. So there's no evidence that the fusion actually accelerates the problem at the next level. So uh, that's just kind of a, another misperception. Um, uh oh. Hear me, but my computer has crashed.
Can you hear us? Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you, but I can you see my screen? Yes, but it's the same screen. Yeah, I for some reason my, my computer has crashed. I, I, it's frozen. Um, I don't know how to exit out of this. You know, it happened right when I looked at my phone. I wonder if there was a relationship. Yeah, you shouldn't have done that. I know. Um, I don't teach. I could that. kind um, of share your slides, but you probably can't see the screen. Um, do you want to try so to read? I'm going to try and join on another computer. Okay. okay. Or you can send a Sorry. slide to me. I'll host it, and then you can dictate over it. All right. Do you see me entering here? Okay. So I am. Oh, I see you there. There you are. Okay. okay. Wow. wow. You're, You're echoing. echoing. Yeah. Oh, I gotta... I'll just kick you out. Can we kick you out? All right. Let's try that. Kick, kick me out. out. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah, because so I'm, I'm seeing, seeing myself, myself, I think, right? right? Oh, you're there twice. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Um, is there a way you can stop that screen sharing and allow me? Oh, here we go. So I'm not able to share my screen because my other computer has control of that. Are you able to do anything about that? Yeah, I can. I'm going to stop the video on your other one that's not moving. Stop that. I don't know if I can stop. You mean I'm not, I don't know how to unshare that screen. Do you need, I can try to share your slides. I'm trying to share my screen now, but it says the host has disabled it. Oh, let, hold on. You know what? I need to just, because you're on a different login, I'll make you the co-host again. It should work now. Sorry about that. Okay, great. So sorry about that. Let me just get back. Okay, can you see me now? Can you see my screen? Yeah, you just need to go, there you go. Okay, great. Perfect. Okay, so um, let's talk more about the decision-making when we're talking about surgery for these patients. And so, so one of the things that we, we really think about from a surgical stand, standpoint are what are the symptoms? And when we think about patients with spinal stenosis, oftentimes we try to divide the symptoms into back pain which would be sort of the arthritic parts, the degeneration, any instability, as well as versus the nerve pain, which would be the leg pain. And a lot of times the, the symptoms that are present will drive how we treat these patients surgically. Because if a patient comes in and they have stenosis and they have a good component of back pain, and there's a lot of arthritis, there's degeneration of the discs, there's any instability, then we oftentimes think that we might have to consider doing a fusion at the same time. On the other hand, if they purely have just leg symptoms, which we think are from the nerves, and they have stenosis from a herniated disc or just they have acquired stenosis from bone spurs and just arthritis, then we would consider doing a decompression alone. Probably no reason to consider doing a fusion unless there was some instability present. And so what we try to do is we look at the radiographs, we look at the MRIs, and we try to correlate the pathology with the patient's symptoms. And at the same time, we, we try to correlate the pathology with the appropriate surgery. And this is a, a kind of an example. This is the picture I showed earlier where this is a patient who's older. They have arthritis at every level of their lower back. Uh, they may have underlying low back pain for years, which could be related to the multi-level degeneration of the spine, but their 90% of their pain could just be an L5 radiculopathy from this new disc herniation that wasn't present on the prior MRIs. So in that situation, we would sit there and, and counsel the patient, well, for your stenosis down at L45, we're gonna do a little micro decompression. Uh, we're not gonna get rid of all your back pain uh, because you likely have some back pain from all the arthritis here. 
And so a lot of this involves counseling the patient, making sure they have the appropriate expectations. And if the patient understands the pathology and understands the goal of the surgery, that, that oftentimes will be a, a very happy patient. When it comes to doing the, the decompression, and if we're not doing a fusion, we try to do this minimally invasively. And there's a lot of things we can do through these tubular retractors. And we developed the art of trying to do these decompressions through limited approaches. And so there are fixed retractors, which are just tubular, which give us sort of the view of the spine. And then we have expandable retractors that I can actually, you can make a small incision, but then you can actually expand that retractor. And, and even though the incision stays about the same size, it expands open and we can see a lot more through the visualization. And this is an example of a patient that we're doing a, a, a surgery for a stenosis at L5S1. We place this little tubular retractor down there and through that and using the microscope, we're able to visualize the anatomy and be able to do the surgery. And we can oftentimes approach it from one side. So this is an example of her coming in from the right side. We can decompress the right side. And then all we have to do is through the same incision, we can angle the retractor towards the other side, such as what you see here on the right side of the screen. And we can undercut the lamina and decompress the opposite side. And this is just a, a quick example. I, I don't have time to show you the entire video, but it gives you an example of us doing a surgery through these tubular retractors. Here, I'm actually working on the opposite side of the spine. The ipsilateral side is, is, is towards the bottom of the screen. And I kind of want to cut to the chase. You can see this is the cauda equina. We've decompressed the ipsilateral side, which is here at the bottom. And now we're working on the opposite side through the same incision, through this minimally invasive approach. And I want to give you just one viewpoint of, of this. This is the dura, the cauda equina at the end. Um, working towards the end, you can see that it's completely decompressed around both sides. So this is the decompression that we've done through the very small incision, a, a minimally invasive approach. And this is something that we can do. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is when do we do a fusion? Because a lot of patients come in and say, well, I'm a little different. I, I don't want the fusion if I can avoid it. And I always tell these patients, well, everyone wants to avoid a fusion if they can avoid it. I, if it were me, I would want to avoid a fusion. And, and so it's not like we're fusion happy. Uh, this is an example of a patient that has a spondylolisthesis and sponda, spinal stenosis at L45, and we can sort of see the instability there. And so how do we determine if we're going to do a fusion? Well, we can get some idea of whether or not there's instability at the segment. Certainly, we can do the flexion extension x-rays to see if it slips and slides on the flexion extension views. If it stays stable and we do a minimally invasive approach, oftentimes we don't have to do the fusion. If we look at the cross-sectional cut and at this level, we can see the facets are open. So that gives us a sign, you know, at the bottom at L5S1, you can see the facets are normal. Here there's uh, spacing within the facet joints. It gives us an idea. It's going to be a little bit more unstable. So we have to start thinking about doing a fusion. Um, does this patient need a fusion? Well, oftentimes we have to look at it three-dimensionally. We see the spondylolisthesis on the lateral view. You look at the AP view, we can see the bones are shifted. And so this patient has instability on the lateral view as well as the AP view. So this patient likely is very unstable and needs a fusion. It might be a little different if they were only unstable on one view, but not the other. And so here we would probably have to do a fusion. Here's a patient that has stenosis, but you can see the facet joints aren't really wide open. So this patient is probably inherently stable, even though they have a spondylolisthesis, and this patient might be amenable to just a minimally invasive decompression. Uh, we also have to look at the facet joints, and David talked about that. If you have facet joints that are vertically oriented, then this is not going to give you as much stability than if they're transversely oriented. And so here, you can, you can imagine these are going to allow for subluxation. Whereas if the facet joints are transversely oriented, this is going to block and give you a little bit more stability. So if the facets are horizontal, I tend not to fuse those patients as much as if they're vertical because it gives me a sign that they're unstable. And this is an example of a patient that has asymmetrical or facet tropism. It's more vertical here on the right, but it's more transverse on here on the left. So if I had to do a decompression here, I'd only take a part of the facet it would cause less instability than if I had to take a, a, a decompression on the opposite side. Here's an example of two patients, spondylolisthesis at 4-5. The one on the right with the open facets, I probably would consider fusing. The one on the left probably would get by without a fusion because of the facet joints.
Here's a patient that not only has open facet joints, but has a facet cyst. That's even a greater sign of facet problems and likely more instability. You would probably think about doing a fusion, right? Um, here's a patient that has spondylolisthesis. So you can see here, there's a spondylolisthesis at L4-5, but you get a sense that this patient is just stable. You see these bone spurs that are almost bridging across. This patient just inherently looks a little bit more stable than someone who doesn't have these bone spurs and maybe isn't, is more inherently unstable. So you would think about doing a fusion if you thought they were a little bit inherently unstable. These are two patients, spondylolisthesis, they have facet cysts, um, but one on the right is gro grossly more unstable than the one on the left. You can see the facet joints aren't a problem. And this facet cyst comes from facet pathology, but I don't think the facet is un as, as unstable as the one here on the vision on the right. Um, so here's the last thing I wanna talk about. We, we actually take into account the patient's symptoms. So if you imagine a patient has stenosis with a spondylolisthesis, right? And they have no back pain. With the same x-rays, if they have no back pain, I'm less likely to do a fusion. If they have tremendous back pain, regardless of instability, you might consider doing a fusion. If they have no instability, no back pain, I think most of us would agree that we would not do a fusion. We would just decompress the stenosis. But with the same x-rays, if they have no instability, but they have tremendous back pain, we probably would can think about a fusion. If there's no instability, no back pain, and unilateral radicular pain, so we only have to decompress one side, so there's less instability, then you might think about not doing a fusion because you're doing a limited decompression. But if they have no instability, no back pain, and they have more central stenosis, since you don't have to undercut the facets as much, and they have mainly neurogenic claudication, I would think about not doing a fusion. And so an example of that would be um, here. This is a patient where if they have neurogenic claudication, it's probably not foraminal stenosis as much as it is central stenosis. And I can come in here and decompress centrally. It's, you really run into problems when you have radicular pain and you have to undercut the facets and you have to go out uh, unstable. This patient, pretty unstable, but if they have left-sided radicular pain only, you might go in there and say, I'm gonna disrupt this very little by just taking out the facet cyst. So maybe not doing a fusion. Uh, however, in this patient on the left, I feel much more comfortable not doing a fusion because there's no problems with the facet joints. Neurogenic claudication only, for me, this is a slam dunk in the sense I don't think I need to do a fusion because I don't see any problems with the facet joints. So in summary, I, I hope I've given you a little bit of insight into the surgical decision-making, how we kind of approach our decisions and how we decide to do a decompression. You have to understand, and I think hopefully you do, that it's just a combination of taking the patient's symptoms, the pathology, the location of the pathology, and whether they're unstable to really make the proper decision. So with that, thank you very much, and I apologize. For